Hey Camp 30s, let's finish off chapter 15 here with uh, chapter 15.2 on Le Chatelier's principle and predicting changes caused by stress on a system in equilibrium. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to impose a stress upon an equilibrium system. Now stress might be kind of a confusing word to look at here. But according to Le Chatelier, what he was talking about was that if I make a change and impose it on a system that is already in balance, like most other natural systems, be they biological, physical, or chemical, they are going to respond to that imbalance. And what we find is in chemistry, the system, that equilibrium that you're looking at, will shift in such a way to oppose the change that you have just made. So what this ultimately means is that if something is in balance, it likes to be there. Now we're personifying chemical reactions when we say this, but it does work. So think about what's going on with Le Chatelier's principle, and we'll look at it in three steps. And we're, we're always gonna look at it this way in kind of like three different phases as we try and identify what happened, identify the stress, and then predict the shift and look at the consequences of it. So remember that to do Le Chatelier's principle, you must be in an equilibrium state. Your reaction rates forward and backward have balanced. It's very much like the video from North Carolina where the guy's moving the two beakers back and forth, and the water level in the two vessels is staying the same, even though he's consistently, consistently moving water. All right, that is a system in equilibrium. Now think about what would happen if I imposed a stress, such as adding water to one of the vessels. Well, what's going to happen is the system isn't going to like this. It was in balance with the water that it already had. By artificially adding more water, what's going to happen is the equilibrium shift of the Chatelier response, all right, in this non-equilibrium state, will have to oppose this action. If I dump water into one of those vessels, then the reaction rates are going to shift in such a way that it can get rid of some of this water. It wants to oppose the action of water addition. I hope that makes sense. So we would ultimately get to a new equilibrium state depending upon the changes we make. These might be the same as before or different. And we can take a look at things such as concentration uh, or pressure and volume arrangements or rearrangements for these various stresses. So we will study three different ways to uh, shift the position of equilibrium. In other words, there are three ways in which we are going to cause stress. The reaction is going to oppose this stress we have imposed, and we're going to achieve a new equilibrium because of it. The first one that we will do, and this is probably the most applicable, you'll see most questions along this line, is we're going to change the concentration of one of the reactants or products. Now this means we can either increase the concentration of one of your reactants or products. If I do that, then I should see an equilibrium shift towards the side opposite to that substance. In other words, if I increase reactant, Le Chatelier says the system doesn't like this and wants to oppose increased reactant. So then the forward reaction should increase in its rate, consuming more reactant, but also producing more product until a new equilibrium is reached. If I was to decrease that concentration of one of these things, then I will see the reaction shift in such a way to the side that I made this stress. Again, an example would be, I have a system in equilibrium and I decide to decrease the concentration of a product. Suddenly now I have less product. The system doesn't like this. It responds in such a way to oppose this and therefore the forward rate of reaction must increase to produce more product. And so we see a shift to the side of the decreased concentration or a shift to the side opposite the increased concentration. What's important to realize is that our equilibrium law values will be the same. The relative concentrations might switch, but when you take a look at the ratio of concentrations of products to reactants, the K value ultimately ends up being the same even with these changes. So we can take a look at an example here. We'll talk about the Haber process. 
And this is the process by which we manufacture ammonia from its elements of nitrogen and hydrogen. You can see that it is a 1 to 3 to 2 ratio. You can see it's in equilibrium. We can see that they're all gases. Now let's talk about a theoretical change that we're going to make here. All right, if hydrogen is added, the hydrogen concentration gets increased. So what I've done is I have caused a stress. The stress is simply this. It is the increased concentration in hydrogen. In the graph, we see that we are at equilibrium. And then at this point right here, we see a sudden stress the increase in sudden concentration of hydrogen. I've just suddenly dumped a whole bunch of hydrogen into the same vessel, therefore the concentration has gone up. This is the stress on the system. All right, this is not Le Chatelier. Le Chatelier says that we must respond oppositely to this stress. So which of these two reactions, the reverse or the forward, could successfully counteract this sudden increase in hydrogen? Would producing more product help and shifting to the forward reaction? Or would producing more reactant help? Bonus points to you if you figured out that it's going to be a shift forward, or in other words, to the right, in order to consume more of the reactant, but producing more product. This would, if we shift to the right, decrease the amount of hydrogen in this equilibrium. What will happen is, we will end up with a system that has more hydrogen, more ammonia, but less nitrogen. This value over here will be equal in K value, both right and left. Hopefully this makes a little bit of sense. We're talking about an imposed stress, identify that. Predict a shift right or left to oppose this. And then what are the consequences that we get afterwards? The consequences afterwards would be if the uh, forward reaction rate increases, I would consume more nitrogen, it would go down. I had an artificially increased amount, but then I would decrease from there. And my ammonia, which was fixed before, would increase in its concentration as well. All right, that's just one example there. Other ones that we can look at would be changes in temperature. Remember, temperature is a measure of the available energy for particles to collide in a reaction. Therefore, by changing the temperature, you change the available kinetic energy by which these particles or reactions can climb that energy barrier that we remember from thermo. Changing the temperature will, of course, be an imposed stress. You are going to change the energy, so you're going to disproportionately affect the number of particles can get over that barrier. If I increase the temperature, the reaction is going to shift to the side opposite the energy term. So this is a good thermo whoops, connection that we have. Remember that we, in thermochemistry, included energy as a reactant for endothermic reactions and energy as a product for exothermic reactions. So if we illustrate where the energy is in the reaction, we can see what would happen if we increase or decrease temperature. If I decrease the temperature available to the reaction, I'm going to shift to the side containing energy term because I'm trying to replace the lost energy. If I increase the temperature, I'm going to shift to the side opposite the energy term because I'm trying to use that artificially increased energy. What's important to realize is that k-value will change with temperature. All right, Things will not work out um, like they did with concentration to equal k's afterwards. This was a huge question that would always come up theoretically on the diploma exam, in which we were looking for which systems, systems changed K or which systems left K unaffected. So remember, from thermochemistry, exothermic reactions treat energy as a product. Endothermic, treat it as a reactant, as viewed from the forward reactions we were concentrating on back then. So take a look at this example down at the bottom of the page. All right, we have sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen to produce sulfur trioxide and some surplus energy. So this one right here is exothermic. Okay, now what we've done is we've decreased the temperature. So the energy term has been decreased. We've taken away available energy and cooled this reaction. 
the Chatelier says the reaction is now upset and doesn't like this and wants to oppose this action. So which reaction? Left towards reactants or right towards products increases to replace the missing energy. All right, we can see that it should be the forward because if I lose energy product, I have to shift to the right to replace that lost energy. In the graph, we see this, all right? We've achieved equilibrium, temperatures was decreased, and so if the forward reaction increases, I should consume more sulfur dioxide, which we see here going down. We should consume more oxygen, which we see decreases, but we should produce more sulfur trioxide as we try to replace the lost energy, and therefore its concentration increases. All right, that's the first two stresses that we can look at. Uh, we'll take a look at pressure volume, which is a little bit uh, weirder, but uh, we can look at a couple of cheats to help get around that one, and then we will do some examples. See you in the next video.